good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a topic that uh, was provided. Uh, the question is, there is a changing paradigm as far as diet is concerned, and the, di the dietary recommendations around the world are having an impact on the global palm oil market. Now, the reason why palm oil is uh, targeted is because if you look at the two oils that we harvest from the oil palm tree, palm oil and palm kernel oil, palm oil has 50% saturated fatty acids, palm kernel oil has an excess of 80% saturated fatty acids. And when it forms part of your diet, there is a, or there appears to be concern related to the health and nutritional effects of the overall diet that we consume. But in making these recommendations, the uh, experts often forget one thing. It is not palm oil alone that is saturated. And in fact, if you look at the Western Hemisphere, the contribution of saturated fatty acids in the diet of the uh, Western population is minuscule. Uh, it's less than two or three energy percent. But in the diet that you and I consume on a daily basis, these are some of the saturated fatty acid sources that we generally or regularly consume, coconut oil, palm kernel oil, which are both uh, rich in lauric and maristic acids, and you have cocoa. Now, cocoa is an interesting saturated fat uh, commodity, uh, high in stearic acid, and if you look at the nutritional literature, they actually uh, project cocoa as healthy uh, because uh, there are huge recommendations that say uh, cocoa butter is good, Cocoa fat is good for you, despite the high content of stearic acid, but it is coupled also with palmitic acid, which is also from our own palm oil. Um, like the first speaker in the morning said, uh, if you look at the uh, paradigm of recommendations for fat, dairy fat, butter is uh, indicated, butter is hugely consumed, and uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, both butter and meat actually contribute butter, meat, and dairy fat actually contribute the largest content of saturated fat in the diet. And yet in the dietary recommendations, they are not individually targeted, but just that you get a overlay and say that control saturated fat per se as it is. Now, the problem with, we face with palm oil is its composition. Composition in the sense that if you look at the spread of fats that's available, palm oil sits in the center, and for people like me and much of the industry, it is not saturated, it's a balanced soil, but the issue is how do we project the balanced nature of it against nutritional advice. The problem that's been faced by uh, the world today is that dietary recommendations have today flipped themselves. Uh, ten years ago, uh, the medical community, the health community, uh, was uh, single-minded in stating that saturated fatty acid com composition, no matter where it came from, was a proven risk factor for heart disease. And as a result, what happened is that if you go to your doctor, there were recommendations that indicated uh, reduce your total fat intake, reduce your saturated fat intake. Now, these recommendations flipped the consumer, the population, to choose low-fat diets, and as a result, low-fat diets meant you substituted the fat content in your diet with a higher carbohydrate content, sugars, refined sugars, uh, uh, fat in, in place of saturated fat and uh, total fat indeed. Now, in the last 10 years, science has gone bonkers, as I say, because we have seen an emergence of new evidence. Now, uh, the debate on saturated fat for you is actually 50 years or more. It's about 65 years old. Started with the initial data from this very famous man, Ansel Keys, who did the study. But uh, he was, at that time, when he first published, he was reckoned to be the god of the lipids. But, to, but uh, in today's media, he has been ostracized and scrutinized for cherry-picking the data that sent the entire scientific community into a tailspin. And today, many scientists around the world think that the scientific community had probably wasted more than 50 years 
looking at the hypothesis that was generated from Ansel Keys and partners, and we were led astray. But is that true? I think there is truth in this, because if you look at some of the uh, latest dietary recommendations, now this comes um, from uh, the US dietary guidelines. At one time, fat used to be the most cited ingredient in your diet. Today, if you look at uh, oils and fats, the yellow table there, it is like a minuscule part of your recommendations, but this does not mean that you do not need to pay attention to oils and fats. Oils and fats are part of your macronutrients, which are protein, carbohydrates, and fats. You still have to look at it, but the trick now is how do we balance overall composition in order to get uh, better healthy outcomes. A big problem in throughout the world, and uh, whether you're, you're dealing with a Western population, an educated population, or a uh, non-defined Asian population such as, uh, we assume, or the food industry assumes, that uh, we go to a large land, we are regulated, and the last speaker indicated, labeling laws are intense, what you can put on a food label is highly regulated, but the question is, who reads the labels? Consumers till today are not educated to read the label. They hardly pay any attention. I'm, I think uh, if you, uh, 100 out of 100 times when you go to a supermarket and buy a product, you hardly read a label both more than two or three times in the entire purchase stream that you do. But despite this, as a food manufacturer, you have to adhere to labeling rules, regulations, etc. And you will see in this label, this is an American uh, label, where you will see uh, uh, fat, uh, fat being depicted, and today you also need to address trans fatty acids. So what, what is happening? Definitions of what makes a good fat and bad fat invariably reflects and comes back to saturated fats. Now, the, the general hypothesis or concept of thinking has been saturated fats increase cholesterol, and therefore they are risk for heart disease. The definition of a fat, if a fat hardens at room temperature, it is a bad fat. And this is unfortunate for palm oil, because if I take palm oil into a cold region uh, in winter, it hardens. And the concept that the consumer uh, feels is that this is a hard fat, and it's bad for you, it's not worth eating, and therefore they avoid it. Now, this is one of the major reasons why if you go to uh, the Western countries or temperate countries, you do not see a bottle of palm oil on the shelf because it hardens, it's, it's, the, it's a reflective uh, scenario that uh, gives a bad perception to the consumer. And of course, if you're looking at hydrogenated fats, uh, today everybody agrees trans fat is bad, but despite all this, go back to butter. Butter is still seen as a, as a, as a great fat, uh, good culinary uh, uh, use, and the master chefs around the world will swear by butter despite this bad s s definition. Um, okay, uh, let me uh, get over this. Now, if you think saturated fats and uh, hard fats are bad, there is an emerging evidence, and we need to get onto this. Uh, the emerging evidence is that the world has been educated to shift from, away from saturated and hard fats to polyunsaturated fats. So these dietary recommendations we have say increase your saturate, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids through the consumption of sunflower seed oil, rapeseed oil, corn oil, soybean oil. But the medical community is increasingly paying attention to it. Unfortunately, although some of these uh, anti-nutritional properties of polyunsaturated oils are being cited, but they are not being reflected to the consumer in, in appropriate and regular terms. And uh, this may come up, but it's so well disguised that the consumer still feels that the best oil or fat is still polyunsaturated oil, because, despite some of these red flags, you can read on this, uh, they go from uh, immune functions, cancer, to uh, uh, impaired growth and reproductive systems, and yet nobody makes a dime about what uh, should we realign ourselves. Okay, so is there hope for saturated fat, is, and is there hope that we can change the mindset of the uh, consumer. 
I think there is. What has been happening in, the, in this last decade, in this decade, 10 years, is that we have seen a proliferation of new data from the scientific community. Some of these scientists were actually the older, uh, older generation scientists who had stated that saturated fats were bad for, for you. But uh, we, they started using a tool called meta-analysis. And this meta-analysis has the ability to take 20, 30, 50 studies uh, done by independent laboratories into a single statistical model and analyze the overall outcome. And for example, here is a meta-analysis done out of the Harvard Medical School. And they were interested in looking at what is the impact of saturated fatty acids on disease risk in the form of cardiovascular disease risk, increased cardiovascular disease risk from saturated fat. They combine some of the, what they call as the most critical studies in, in the literature that stated that saturated fats were bad for you. They put it under the meta-analysis and they created this wonderful diamond. The bottom line in this statistical meta-analysis model is that if that diamond crosses the zero line, the line that's drawn, or very near, it means that the component, in this case the saturated fat, that you're testing for effect on disease is null. So it's a null hypothesis, or in, in layman's terms, it does not have an effect on risk for heart disease. And this uh, appeared very critically, very nicely in this uh, Harvard-based research. And interestingly, they also did analysis for stroke, because you can talk about cholesterol, you can talk about uh, cardiovascular risk disease, but ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest uh, paradigm of modern living is the onset of stroke. And when stroke hits you, you don't know when it'll hit you, right? But in this analysis, we looked at, uh, they looked at saturated fat impact on stroke. And the bottom line again was that saturated fat was not implicated in the etiology of stroke. So you have two major degenerative diseases that traditionally were thought to be impacted by saturated fat. In this case, both did not have. Now, this study in 2010 set the ball rolling. A huge debate uh, happened. And uh, this is not alone in the literature today. There is a proliferation of new literature that says that saturated fats do nothing to you. But uh, what, what the scientific community is doing is that it's divided. Health professionals, nutritionists, dietitians, the American Heart Association is divided because they spend half a century of work on scientific uh, exposure of fats. And today, after 50 years, they are being proven wrong. And if you are proving somebody wrong, they don't like you. There are indications or examples of several other studies that point to this no or null effect of saturated fatty acids, but too bad. They are not often cited, they are hidden in the literature, and you need articulate scientists to bring it out and pass on the message to the consumer. But the impact is that it is still difficult to pass these messages to the consumer, but the bottom line is that there is enough evidence to indicate that saturated fats may not be the bad boy uh, as we thought all along. Now, and these are examples of uh, recent studies that have been ignored. Although they are published in some of the better journals, they are being contested within the scientific community. But what it means is that we, in the palm oil industry, need to look at these type of studies and say, is there an advantage that we can couple to our own data on palm oil in order to sell to the uh, consumer that palm oil as an overall matrix or uh, a part of your overall diet is still safe and healthy. So it's a huge effort, one, to, con uh, to concentrate and convince your fellow scientists, two, then to take these messages and pass on to the consumer so that the issue of no palm oil labels as indicated earlier would even disappear from a scenario. Uh, do fats, and, and there's always an indicator while we look at fats, uh, there is a school of thought that now suggests that certain fats may help to reduce weight because obesity is a, is a big issue. 
And, uh, but the bottom line is that, remember when I said that when people moved away from saturated fat or reduced total fat intake in the diet, they invariably moved or chose to go to a carbohydrate-rich diet. Now, low fat was advocated or is still advocated even among your doc doctors, your dietitians. If you go to IJN, they'll probably tell you the first thing to do that today after you, had a, uh, you were unfortunate to have a bypass operation is reduce fat and go to a low-fat diet. But if you switch to a low-fat diet and do not reduce your total calorie or energy intake, most likely you would get, uh, you are substituting your low-fat with carbohydrate. And a whole generation of children have evolved, especially in the West, with a problem of obesity. So uh, nutritionists around the world are looking at what will happen if this continues and you need to do corrective measures. And uh, look at this for example. This is an interesting data again that is well hidden, but we managed to take it out. Uh, if you look at saturated fat and heart disease, higher rates of heart disease were associated with lower levels of saturated fat intake in the, in the countries that were indicated. And you, you can see the graphs are self-explanatory. But if in countries where they then move towards a low saturated fat intake, and this had been going on for about 25 years, and when they did the analysis, lower rates of heart disease were now associated with higher levels of saturated fat in the diet. Now, trust me, even to the experts, this is very, very confusing. So it's even more confusing when people have to write dietary guidelines and advise consumers, and that dietary guideline needs to be translated into uh, uh, food facts by the food industry. Where does palm oil stand? Um, you, uh, just a simple example. Uh, we are today in a position through research published in peer-reviewed journals, we are able to equate palm oil or palm oleine with olive oil, okay? And the research has been done. It has been done in Malaysia, in, uh, in the University of Sydney in Australia, it's been done in China. So the, the evidence is there, but when we try at MPOC, when we try to carry the evidence to the consumer, we are challenged. We are, we are accused of cherry picking the data, but we tell them, look, our, our facts, our promotional facts are based on true science, you're welcome, and all of you are also welcome to look at these data and make a point or make an analysis of whether the promotional material we sometimes use on behalf of palm oil is true or false. But the bottom line is that the mandate given to us is to use science and use it uh, in a proper manner. The one fat that the world needs to get rid of and the movement is very strong is hydrogenated fat. Uh, remember, in the 1980s, the Americans blasted us because they thought they were the gods uh, of uh, nutrition, but they were eating hydrogenated fats. And 10 years later, in 1990, the research from uh, uh, Mensing and Catan uh, set the ball rolling. And today, the bottom line is that you want to move towards zero trans because trans increases risk for heart disease, increases risk for obesity, increases risk for cancer. But it has been a long journey. If you look at it, you are talking about legislation in, uh, of MCPD in palm oil. It's not going to happen in two years, three years, 10 years. The trans legislation has taken 25 years before it is coming into force. And yet there are several countries around the world who have not paid any attention to this. Uh, but the bottom line is that we've done studies with palm oil and showed that palm oil is a viable and suitable substitute for trans fatty acid. This was actually cited in a New England Journal of Medicine publication. Our paper was cited there, and it lent support for the fact, and we got uh, people around the world uh, to evaluate the nutritional science about palm oil and say that palm oil is a reasonable replacement of trans. And this was important because it triggered the re-entry of palm oil in the U.S. market. Today, the United States is, uh, is a proud end user of nearly uh, in excess of one million tons of palm oil for its solid fat formulations. But let us not sit on our laurels because even as we say, uh, we have a closure on trans fat, 
Last week, I saw a report uh, advocated by WHO. WHO is now re-questioning uh, the issue of trans fat and how we use palm oil as a replacement. So uh, it goes in circles, ladies and gentlemen, even when you have a data that show uh, that is almost assured that palm is doing you well, the food industry needs to do this, we still have issues that we need to tell. So it's a vicious circle that still continues. And that vicious circle is translated into consumer advocacy uh, in Europe, for example. Now here, we borrowed this from our friends at Ferrero. And if you look at the survey that they have done, it shows and it, it, uh, it, it looks at palm and uh, various oils, how they are featured um, in, in certain countries in Europe. The image for palm in Europe is not uniform. There are certain countries that hate palm or look at palm as a, as a vicious bad boy. There are others like Germany who don't care. So it is not a common denominator. The hate, uh, hatred or the suspicion about palm is not uh, common throughout Europe. It seems to be triggered by the, end, uh, the lobbying that's done within the country. For example, the highest lobby we are seeing now is in France, in Belgium, and very recently, Italy. So we have to decipher this in order to allow you to sell palm oil uh, in these kind of markets, okay? But don't go astray. Um, 20 years, 25 years ago, if you talk to people about coconut oil, coconut oil uh, was the worst oil, 85% saturated fatty acids in it, and you could, you could die immediately by consuming coconut oil because it was in the, in the, in the uh, myriad of tropical oils. And then somebody, I, you must give kudos to this gentleman or lady who did this, somebody introduced a virginity concept into coconut oil. They made coconut oil virgin, right? And I'm sorry, you guys, you always are looking out for virgins, right? Uh, but the bottom line is that if you scan the media today, there are gurus and gurus and gurus that swear by coconut oil. But to people like me, coconut oil does not carry the signs. Okay, this gentleman, Bruce, uh, Bruce Fief, uh, is one of the highest proponents of coconut oil, and he promotes coconut oil as a miracle oil in the, in the modern era. But don't be alarmed, because this same gentleman also believes in palm oil. And he has written a book, go to amazon.com and buy this book, it's easy reading. And he talks about the virtues of palm oil associated or in tandem with coconut oil. Okay? But ladies and gentlemen, while we have this synergy, and you would have thought that because we could also catch a ride with coconut oil, we are not able to do that. We are not able to do that. And this is something that we need to learn in our marketing, in our branding. Uh, it's a big challenge, but we are definitely trying. Okay? Uh, but not all is lost. We were proud in, in the heydays that uh, we were able to show through research that you could make palm oil a regular feature in a supermarket, even in the, U in the United States. Uh, Smart Balance, it, 25 years ago, this was done. It generated a lot of interest, a lot of income for people involved in it. A combination of fats helped do this, and there's still opportunity to innovate uh, in, in this direction. Now, go back to a little bit on the no palm oil labels, you see. Uh, uh, Paulo and a few other gentlemen talked extensively about it, and there's no uh, denying that, uh, that, uh, that is a problem. But you, you are, you, some of you asked the question, is it illegal? What are the European authorities doing about it? Uh, Paulo himself said that it, uh, the labeling of no palm oil is illegal. But trust me, MPOC initiated a legal uh, action in France as a, as a test case. We find that the European authorities are hiding behind their own regulations. They know that their regulations uh, will, can be enforced, and yet we are seeing a lack of initiative in enforcing that and taking out the no palm oil label from the market uh, supermarket shelf. So although we may go the legal route, I think it's still going to be a major challenge to pull all the palm oil, no palm oil products from the supermarket shelf. So uh, be prepared for the worst. It's going to be a big fight, but that fight is something that we need to win. 
okay? Uh, the other proliferation that I was aghast, and this was last week we were in uh, Warsaw with the European Palm Oil uh, Alliance uh, doing the European Palm Oil Congress. What struck uh, people there was that today there are more than, uh, it's not just RSPO, MSPO, ISPO, all the POs. There are more than 11 certification systems that have zeroed in on palm oil. And I was laughing and crying at the same time because these guys are entrepreneurs. They care two hoots about palm oil. They take care two hoots about the growers. Every single uh, certification scheme is a money-spinning mechanism that they have perfected. So much so, they were, the, 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 the schematic proponents of these were getting up on stage and telling uh, people, the European people in the audience, how palm oil should be grown. And when I crossed uh, some of them and said, have you visited the growing centers? He said, no, we deal with it on, uh, on virtual reality. So this is the kind of advice that's coming from so-called experts, and we need to do that. And what is even more uh, concerning is the one on palm done right. You, we've got to watch out, because this is coming from an organic palm oil producer who thinks that his system is the best in the world, and if he had his way, he wants the entire palm oil industry to go organic before it can be certified sustainable. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, bottom line is that we have a major battle in our hands. Uh, some, sometimes when you talk to people, they say, oh, saturated fat has been dealt in the right area. We can immediately do it for marketing, for, con for educating the consumer. There is a still a challenge because there's a gap between the scientific information and the consumer perception. We need to deal with it. And it's still going to take time. And even as it takes time, the debate is revolving because in the scientific community, in the medical experts, they are not unified. Uh, you know, I sit on the left side, somebody else would sit on the right side. And there are a whole battery of uh, very eminent scientists and professionals who sit on the left or the right. So until these people come in and uh, adhere to norm, uh, unbiased evaluation of the data, and write that into nutritional guidelines or consumer uh, advice, we still will have problems with palm oil, and palm oil will continue to be perceived for what it is not. So the fight will continue and be prepared for a long haul fight. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that uh, this has been helpful, and uh, you know we at MPOC are there to assist the industry to move forward with the help of MPOB, and uh, uh, we are your, uh, your knights. Sometimes our armor is not shining. You just have to put more, more shine into our armor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sundram. <clears throat> we have time for one question. Does anybody have one question? In the back of the room? Dr. Sundram, we have one question for you. Good afternoon, Dr. Sundram. Uh, I have a question for you. You talked about uh, uh, palm oil sedimentation in the temperate climates, which is a fact. Now, uh, many of the producers uh, use a food grade uh, substance called STS, uh, which keeps it uh, dispersed for a longer period of time. So, uh, does it have a, a counter effect or is it uh, safe to be edible enough? Okay. Uh, I'd like to have your view on that. Thank you. All right. Uh, we try to uh, add so-called anti-crystallizers into olein or palm oil in order so that it does not solidify at cold temperatures. Uh, the anti-crystallizer use is rather limited or its, uh, its uh, ability to stop the crystallization process is very limited. Now, uh, what happens is that the crystallization is an intrinsic uh, nature of palm oil. The moment the first uh, beta prime crystal uh, takes sh shape in the oil, it's a matter of time before it coalesces all the other mole the saturated fat molecules and, and dumps it at the bottom. Uh, it's difficult. We simply have to live with, uh, with that. But look at it this way. The world is awash with liquid oils, right? Uh, there is actually 
a uh, increasing demand despite all the issue about saturated fat there's an increasing demand for solid fats and that is why your price of steering has has proportionally increased over the years okay so why would we want to lose a nature given benefit and goes chasing a liquid oil think think of your marketing in that perspective and you'll probably do well thank you